there, isn't it? Now, I came up here with a backpack full of shade 14 glass, which I'll tell you about in a few minutes, and it wore me out. <laughs> I hope we go skiing tomorrow, but I hope it's not in a bunch of slush. Anyway, um, welcome, all of you, and I hope you have a, a good rest of the afternoon here. As you can see, we've got a lot going on on campus. Uh, and for those of you who are prospective students, we're hoping that you get a good flavor, a good taste of what our campus is all about, and that you'll come here. So today, I'd like to tell you about a couple of interesting phenomena that you'll be able to see right here from the Bay Area, or more optimally, one of them if you drive for a few hours. Um, but uh, but you know, even if you choose to stay here, you'll be able to see them. So what I'm going to talk about, first of all, is uh, a special type of partial eclipse of the sun called an angular eclipse. And then I'll talk about Venus kind of crawling across the face of the sun. I'll talk about the significance of that. So normally when you look at the sun, it's just this bright thing, right? You shouldn't look at it for very long. Just take a brief glance at it. But occasionally there's an annulus, a ring of fire showing. And this rare event, one example, will be coming to us this uh, May 20th in four weeks, okay? And as I'll show you from some maps, if you just drive a few hours, you'll put yourself in a position, if you drive the right way, okay, to see the annulus. And if you just choose to stay here, let's say you can't make a day trip, you'll see a, you know, sort of a, a almost uh, ring-like structure, like a seat, okay? But I can't resist talking about a total solar eclipse, since I'm talking about a special case or a partial one. Let me tell you a little bit about total, total solar eclipses, and you'll have a chance to see one of those in five years from the continental US. A total eclipse of the sun happens when the moon just barely covers the bright disk of the sun, the so-called photosphere, revealing this ghostly, tenuous corona. It's just a magical sight. And the moments leading up to totality are just incredible. And the whole thing, you know, only lasts a couple of minutes and stuff, so just the adrenaline is really flowing and stuff. Anyway, um, these are marvelous phenomena to see. Here's an example of one seen from a ship. What happens is the moon and the sun have relative distances that are exactly the same as their relative sizes. Let me explain what I mean. The sun is exactly, or almost exactly, 390 times bigger than the moon in physical size. But it's also 390 times farther away. So, in terms of how big they look in the sky, they're the same size. They subtend, they cover the same angle in the sky, about half a degree. So the moon casts a shadow on a very, very small part of the Earth like this. Now, if you take, for example, a tennis ball and a ping pong ball, their diameters are roughly in a two to one proportion, okay? So if I represent the sun with this tennis ball and the moon with this ping pong ball, and I arrange their relative distances such that it's two to one, then the ping pong ball looks exactly as big as the tennis ball. It beautifully covers the, the tennis ball. If, it, if the moon is too far away, then it doesn't quite cover the tennis ball as seen by me because it looks too small. If it's too close, then it more than covers the tennis ball. So it covers not only the bright parts, but also the faint corona around it. Okay? But we have this perfect situation where the ratio of the sun's distance to the moon distance, 390, is the same as the ratio of the sun's size to the moon's size, 390. And there's no reason it should have been this way. It's just a cosmic coincidence that allows us to enjoy this amazing phenomenon, the total solar eclipse, okay? So the stages of an eclipse are as follows. Through a filter, a sun, the sun looks yellow or some other color. The sun's intrinsic color is white, it turns out. Okay? But as the moon creeps over, you see more and more of the sun being cut off. 
And the partial phases inbound last about an hour and a quarter, an hour and 20 minutes, something like that. Okay? And so there's plenty of time to kind of just wait for totality, the main event. And the partial phases are an interesting novelty, but they're not super thrilling, okay? And then when just a little bit of sunlight shows, you can see that it's in these little beads. That's because the moon's surface is not perfectly smooth. It's not perfectly like a billiard ball. It's got mountains and valleys. And just as the moon's edge is covering the sun's edge, some sunlight can make its way through the mountain valleys and show up. And where there are mountains, the, the sunlight gets blocked. So you get this phenomenon called Bailey's beads after someone who studied them over a century ago. And then the last little bit of the sun is still showing. And in an overexposed photograph like this, the, that little bit of the sun looks very, very bright. And it looks like it's indented into them. It isn't really. It's just a little speck right here. It's highly overexposed. So it looks like a jewel. It looks like a diamond uh, on this ring because you start seeing the inner corona and the chromosphere and stuff. And, and this is a phenomenon known as the diamond ring effect. You get one at the end, uh, sorry, at the beginning and at the end. And they only last for a couple of seconds. This is one of the most magical parts of, the, of an eclipse. And then you that last little part is covered and you get to see a hot layer called the chromosphere because it's colorful. Chromo color that surrounds the surface of the sun, the photosphere. The sun, by the way, is gaseous throughout. It doesn't have a solid surface that you can stand on. By surface, we mean that part of the atmosphere where it becomes opaque, so you can't see into the sun below that part. Anyway, that's the photosphere. But around it is a chromosphere, a nice colorful part. And in the chromosphere, you can see all these little protrusions sticking out of the chromosphere. Those are, are called prominences. They're gentle eruptions from the sun, eruptions of energy, due to energy being dissipated from regions of strong magnetic fields. So you can see these during the eclipse. And then you can see the, the inner corona and the outer and middle corona as well. And this corona is just incredible because you don't expect it, right? Especially if you've never seen photographs of the sun, so I'll kind of ruin it for you. Um, well, the phenomenon is much better than any photograph or any description or even any video can, uh, can demonstrate. By the way, have any of you seen a total eclipse? Partial doesn't count. That would be total. Oh, wow. So you know what I'm talking about. I sound like a lunatic, but I'm not. I assure you. A lunatic, get it? Anyway. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> no, it's just, it's just an amazing thing because you don't expect it. And that's because. You know, when you, when you put up a quarter or a ball and block out the sun normally during the day, you don't see the corona. And the problem is, is that the sunlight has already hit Earth's atmosphere and it's scattered around. And the atmosphere is brighter, that is, the scattered light is brighter than the corona. So you cannot see the corona if you just block the sun, at least not from sea level. From high mountains, you can see a little bit of it. But from sea level, if you just block the sun with a quarter or a ball, you won't see the chromosphere or the corona. You, you have to block the sunlight before it reaches um, the Earth, okay, before it scatters in Earth's atmosphere. And the corona changes from one eclipse to another. Now, welcome, oh, there's plenty more seats. This is kind of an out of the way place on campus, so it's a lot of you don't know where to go. But anyway, um, but the corona changes from one eclipse to another because the charged particles follow the magnetic field around the sun, and that changes with time. So, you know, one reason to go see lots of eclipses is just to see what the corona looks like. And you can see it extends far, far out, many solar diameters out. Um, and it's just, just amazing, okay? So that lasts a couple of minutes. And then you start revealing the chromosphere again as the moon is the other way. And um, a Bailey's bead or two, and if you overexpose it, you get the diamond ring effect again. So, in fact, I got an engaged at a total solar eclipse, and I gave my wife, my, well, my fiance, not one, but two diamond rings. One at the beginning of the eclipse, and one at the I got her a pearl ring. I was not willing as a professor or able as a professor, more than one, to shout out money for a diamond ring. Um, and you know, cubics are coming, it costs one one thousand as much. So. Anyway, uh, well, this shadow that's cast on the Earth moves, and that's because.
that's primarily the moon is orbiting the Earth. But even if it weren't, um, the Earth is spinning, and so different locations on the Earth would be subject to the shadow at different times. Now, Earth is spinning about the same way as the moon is going, so the Earth kind of partially catches up to the racing shadow, but not completely. So the shadow gets traced down on the Earth, and from a satellite, if you take a photograph every half an hour or 45 minutes, you can see the places which, in succession, were experiencing a total solar eclipse. It's where those dark spots are. And you can see they're pretty small compared to the whole Earth. And in fact, this was one of the, this was the longest eclipse in a century. So that means it actually had a pretty wide shadow. Um, and so usually the shadows are even a smaller circle than that. This is the eclipse of July uh, 11, 1991, 20, 21 years ago. I was down at the tip of uh, Baja, California for that. Write it down, just write it down. Sometimes it's computer to go backwards and ask that. But um, I was right down here. Here's the path to the valley, right over Mexico City. Okay. Uh, most places experience only a partial eclipse. Okay. And the farther away you are from the path of totality, the smaller is the bit of the sun that's sort of bit not. And that's because you're not getting a perfectly collinear situation here. You're a little bit off the side. And so the moon covers part of, but, but not all of the sun. I'm going to show this from your perspective now. Usually at new moon, the sun and the moon are not perfectly aligned. That's because their orbital planes are a little bit tilted relative to one another. So usually at new moon, you don't get an eclipse. A few times per year, you can get a partial eclipse. And roughly once every year and a half or so, you get a total eclipse. That is, you get this perfect alignment but only from a narrow range of places on Earth. Like I say, most places see a partial eclipse, and that's kind of fun. I set it up here. Um, but it's not nearly as good as a, a total eclipse. So, though I'm going to tell you in a minute about a very special kind of partial eclipse, in no way should that deter you, if you see it on May 20th, from going out and seeing a true total eclipse. Okay? So there's a round of middle partial eclipse. All right. Here's some paths of totality. You can see that generally a total solar eclipse won't come, come to you. You have to go and seek it. A typical place on Earth has to wait something like 360 years before a total eclipse visits it. So you usually have to go and, and travel. But this is, this is fun because if you had world travel anyway, and there are a bunch of places you want to see, but there's no particular order in which you need to see them, you might as well go to where there's an eclipse. <laughs> in this, then you get to see the country and you get you know, the general talk. And, you know, I've been to Thailand and Mongolia and Tahiti and all sorts of places that I would have wanted to visit anyway, but I chose to do so at a time when there was an eclipse, not the week before or the week after. Okay? No flying the day after the eclipse. Okay? So the next one that you can see, and there's still a chance to alter your plans for the fall to see this one, it's November 13, 14, depending on where you are relative to the international dateline of this year. And it starts out um, in the northeast coast of Australia, goes over the Pacific Ocean, and it ends in Chile. So it starts on November 14, but ends on November 13, because it crosses the dateline from west to east, you see. Here's the, um, the path, okay? I'll be uh, on a cruise sort of between Indonesia and the northeast parts of, uh, of uh, Australia. It's a tough one. And someone has to do it, okay? Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> you know, someone's got to do it. I volunteered, and, you know. For those of you who want to take my Astro C10 class, I won't teach it in the fall because of this two week long cruise. I'll teach it in spring of 2013. So I just feel I can't be away. Anyway, where do you see the little black dot? That's where the total eclipse is. There's a little part there that says. This huge area here is where a partial eclipse is. There's a little, and outside that gray area, the sun and the moon are not aligned at all well enough for even part of the sun to be blocked off. Okay? But look, you know, if you're making that effort to get within a few hundred miles of totality, you might as well get in the path of totality. I mean, if you're out here somewhere and you can't travel, let's say you're in New Zealand, you're, you're, you're in jail or something like that. <laughs> so you can't travel, but you, 
we tell uh, the guy, well, if you want to take your break outside right at the right moment, at least see it partially in place, okay? But if you're that close, it's not good to try to break out of jail. <laughs> <laughs>
But when it's farther than average from the sun, then the moon appears too small, okay? Like this, so I, I mean, only I have my perspective, but you can easily do this, you know, at home, okay, just grab two balls. So, so the moon's apparent size varies with time. And in fact, here's two extreme cases. When it was average, at apogee, that's its farthest uh, distance from the Earth. And when it was at perigee, at its closest approach, you can see there's a considerable difference in size. And this is an extreme example, but these sizes differ by 14%. Okay? Um, more typically, it's like 12% or so. But, um, Anyway, when full moon happens to occur when the moon is farthest from the Earth, that's when you get the smallest apparent moon. And when full moon happens to occur when the moon is closest to the Earth, then you get the, the biggest you know, full moon like this. So in the case of an annular eclipse, which are about as common as total eclipses, in fact, I think they're slightly more common. It's slightly more often the case that the moon is a bit too far away to pull from the sun you get this ring of fire, which is really cool. I, I tried to see one in 1992, and I was spotted out. I, I should have made the effort to drive from LA to San Diego, but my brother was sick and stuff, and so I didn't want to go. If it were a total eclipse, I would say, no, we'll forget you. I'm driving. <laughs> but this is a family gathering, and you know, I mean, it, you know, yeah, I should have gone, but whatever. Anyway, a friend of mine, Arthur Dennis from I think go down to San Diego and caught this wonderful view. Now he's a professional photographer, so he knew that having a neat foreground view makes a picture much more interesting than if you just have something you know, far away. And you can be creative, even though it's not totality, and you can kind of have fun and take multiple photographs like this and put them all together, as Stefan Seid did in, uh, in Germany. So it's not a total drag that you're not getting a true total eclipse. And it's you know, a pretty cool partial eclipse. And at the beginnings and end of the annular part, you can see some of the phenomena of totality. That is, right here, you can see some prominences sticking out. Um, and in the cases where the moon is just barely too small, then even a little bit of corona comes out. I think this time the annulus will be thick enough that I'm kind of doubting that we'll see any corona, but, but maybe we will. We might see some inner corona. You know, watch it and write me an email message. Did you or did you not see corona? I, my prediction is no, but you know, um, who knows, right? So, it's easy to find information on the web. I'll, I'll give you some information right now, but just, you know, Google Yahoo, whatever, annular eclipse 2012. By the way, annular because it's an annulus. It's not annual. Okay, this does not happen periodically on your, your basis. And then there are two people who in particular have good websites. Jay Anderson, who's a, both an astronomer and a meteorologist, and so he has all these weather predictions. And then Fred Espinac, who makes all sorts of predictions exactly where it will be. And then, you know, eclipsemaps.com shows maps in detail. I'm going to show a couple of maps. You can see it stretches from Asia, mostly over the Pacific, basically, and then lands, you know, makes landfall right at sunset or near sunset. So it's going to be a late afternoon phenomenon for us. It was right after sunrise for them, but they're likely to have cloudy weather. But it's not necessarily it's just their odds are worse than ours. OK, here's, here's the important part for us, since I presume most of you are in or near California, although not all of you probably. If you're somewhere in Massachusetts, you know, fly on over, OK, and done. Anyway, here is the path from which you will see an annulus. Now, if you're on the central line, this orange thing here, the moon will be perfectly centered on the sun at mid-eclipse. The closer you are, oh, oh and, and the eclipse and the annulus will last the longest, about four and a half minutes. That's great. The closer you are to the edge here, either this one or that one, the farther off center the moon will be at mid-eclipse. And then if you're outside that band, the moon won't quite, I mean, you won't quite see an annulus of the sun. You'll see sort of a, a, a nice sea, and that would be cool. So you should watch it, even, even if you're for somehow chained on Sunday, May 20th of the Bay Area. Um, you know, for some reason you have to stay here, you know. Still watch it, but uh, it just, you won't quite see an annulus. And, and the farther you are away from the center line, the shorter is the eclipse. But it turns out that 
even out to like here, you still get something like three minutes. And then it plots two, one, zero minutes. Now let me show you. Um, oh, the partial phase, by the way, will last several hours. I mean, by minutes, I mean how many minutes we will be able to see this annulus. So here's a bit of a closer view, okay? So we're, um, we're, we're right about down here, okay? I, I wanted to zoom on this a little bit. But, you know, here's Chico. That's where I'm probably going to go. I'm probably going to go to Chico. So I'm not going to be on the second line. But I get three minutes and 15 seconds there. And it's not a very long drive. Let's have some friends there. I know a bunch of people who are going to Reading, Mount Shasta. That's a nice area close to the center line. If you're in Reno, you know, take a few minutes off from gambling and uh, go outside, okay? <laughs> if you're skiing, although most places are really closed by then. You know. Anyway, um, this, is the, this is the area. Red Bluff, Redding. Now, um, a, few, a few facts. In California, the partial eclipse begins at 5.20 Pacific Daylight Time. Plus or minus a few minutes, because it depends on where you are. Okay. Mid-eclipse will be around 6.27 p.m. Okay, last up to four and a half minutes if you're at the central line or very near it. And like I say, you don't have to be super near it. You still get about four minutes, and then it starts dropping precipitously as you get close to the edges. Um, eclipse ends at, at 7.34 or so, and sunset is shortly thereafter. Um, so we can see the whole thing from here, including, including uh, the annular part. And then here is a diagram that illustrates what I was talking about in terms of times. Let's take a look at this. So on the center line here, it's hard for me to see from here, but yeah, okay, so it's going to be like, you know, 4 minutes and 35 seconds, 4 minutes and 40 seconds, something like that. 4 minutes and 24 seconds, 4 minutes and 15, 10, 5, 4 minutes. <laughs> Here's Chico at 3 minutes and 12 seconds, something like that. And you can see it drops off 1 minute 30, and then it just kind of plummets, you know. And if you're in Ukiah, then that's not good, okay, because you'll just see this little thing like that. That'll still be cool if you have to be there. But, but if you can travel that day, it's a Sunday, you know, not all that many people are working. Just go, go somewhere here, okay? The other thing you need to keep trying, of course, uh, and maximize your odds is, is the weather, okay? The weather is an important factor. Now, this shows average cloud cover in percent um, on May 20th based on historical data between 1982 and, and 2008. I guess not for May 20th, but average May cloud cover. And you see, you know, I mean, Arizona's very nice and stuff, but they're not going to witness the annular uh, phases down here. Actually, I think this goes over the Grand Canyon, which is really cool. Right? Um, these yellow parts here are pretty good, um, but not great. The blue parts are even better. So you kind of want to be where it's most blue. And here's a little graph, or a little table that shows Asia. So here's Asia, and it's going to be probably cloudy. You know, it's going to be holes in various places. <coughs> On average, 70% cloud cover. Over the Pacific, Japan, actually, it's Japan. Pretty cloudy. And then they don't show the vast expanse of ocean. Okay? They kind of go from Omaha to Eureka. That's one small step for man. You know, one giant leap for man. So, here in the Western US, it's going to be pretty good, but when you see there are variations, and I'm not sure I believe all of them. Like Oroville here is very close to Chico. And Oroville looks like it has like 12% cloud cover. It's the Oroville Airport. It's really sunny, but is it really that much cloudier at Chico? Right? What? Is this something you love the word average cloud? But our Chico, so here's my question. In Oroville, the Chico? Really? So there's some sort of a, there's some sort of a, I don't even see a map range or anything. I'm just, I'm, just, I'm you know, puzzled and, and surprised. <laughs> okay, well, anyway, having mobility is a good idea, you know. Um, Especially if you don't have super heavy equipment that takes a long time to 
find the setup. And you're, you're just sitting there and it's completely cloudy and you call up your friend in Oroville and they say it's clear. <laughs> you go a couple of miles to Oroville, but it's just, it's just quite astonishing that you go from 12% cloud cover to cheat code is, uh, you know, it's sort of, it's one of these. So I, I, I imagine that the truth is somewhere right in there, but maybe you're right. Maybe there's something geographically there that, that sets it apart. Anyway, I, I think that's where I'll go, but a bunch of people are going to Reading, Mount Shasta, and that, that's pretty good, 30%. And again, these are often patchy clouds. Late May is rarely completely overcast. So you might see some fluffy popcorn clouds. Uh, if you have some mobility, maybe aim for a hole. That's where cruise ships really nice for polar clips, is they improve your odds by 5 to 10% because uh, you can aim for holes. Uh, just try to judge which direction the cloud is coming and going. You know, don't go to a place which is a hole right now and it turns into a cloudy area <laughs> you know, ten, 10 minutes later, right? Uh, so that, that would not be good. But, uh, but anyway, they're great odds, great odds. And take a Sunday drive and, and go to the go over there somewhere. Now, um, I was asked to mention for an amateur astronomy group, the San Francisco Amateur Astronomers, they are organizing a road trip, an overnight trip. But you don't have to go overnight if you don't want to. Um, but they have accommodations here. They're, oops, they're going to um, they're going to the Mount Shasta area. So they're going to be maybe right over here somewhere. Um, you have to be a bit careful with mountains because, of course, moisture-laden air comes in through the Pacific, hits mountains, gets lifted up, cools, and condenses. So you've got to be a little bit careful if you're on the side of a mountain, right? Um, I have not quizzed it in detail about exactly where that would be, but they are you know, pretty avid astronomers, so they will not just sit there if it looks like it's going to be very bad. They will get in their cars and go somewhere nearby. Um, in terms of sort of the blue, yellow area, that, that's a pretty good area, I mean, you know, in terms of uh, general conditions. But anyway, email them at roadtrip.sfaa.org if you want. Now, how do you actually view this thing? Very important, eye safety. Eye safety, okay? Don't want you suing me or the university, right? More importantly, don't want you to harm your eyes, okay? You need a filter that cuts out all but one part in 100,000 of the light. 99.999% of the light gets cut out. Not just the visible light, which your eye sees, but also the sun emits some ultraviolet light that does make it through the atmosphere. The ozone cuts out most ultraviolet light, but not all of it, as, as we know. You, know. you get sunburns from what's called the near ultraviolet. That can very much harm your eyes. And the near infrared can harm your eyes as well. So you need a type of filter that cuts out 99.999% of all the light. Regular sunglasses, even polarized ones, just won't cut it. Smoked glass won't cut it. Exposed negatives, you know, of film won't cut it. You know, when I was a kid, we used to use this kind of stuff, and you know, it's amazing to have my eyesight. But we now know a lot more. Don't use those things. Um, you can order special glasses online. They can be a little bit flimsy, cardboard things. It's a picture of a woman in Peru during a partial stage of an eclipse, a photo eclipse I went to in 1994. It's obviously not a very good time. But, but you know, and, and here is Kiki in the knee, it's having a good time. And you can't watch a photo eclipse without eating total cereal, right? I, I have no stock in any cereal. But anyway, these are, these are cheap, a couple of bucks online, plus, you know, shipping and handling, all that kind of stuff. But they're a little bit flimsy, all right? I have a better alternative, although this isn't bad. Um, depending on what kind of filter you get, the sun will look some shade of yellow or green or whatever. The sun's true color is white. Um, if you use a neutral density filter, the way for you know, many professional photographers like neutral density because it cuts out all the way equally, then you see the more typical natural colors. The thing I recommend is what's called shade 14 welder's glass. Very durable, you can't really scratch it, doesn't get all mangled up if you stick it in your pocket. In fact, I, I often carry a piece with me wherever I am, just kind of take a look at the sun every once in a while to see if I can see any sunspots. Okay? And it gives a green tinge to the sun, but you know, again, who cares? You know. um, 
It's just the sun. And you can mount it on a sheet of cardboard <laughs> like this. Yeah, yeah. So this makes it easier to hold, and it also shades you. See, so you I'm going to sunburn and stuff. This is on the clip screws and, you know, in Polynesia a couple of years ago where people are watching. Um, I don't know why this person is like wearing a Stanford color this year. You know, <laughs> Take off that red shirt, right? But anyway, the rest of us have blue shirts on. So I brought a bunch of stuff. And it turns out it's hard to find because welding supply stores don't generally carry such dark glass. Because even people working with oxy acetylene torches generally don't have a flame that's that bright. So shade 14 is really dark, OK? So they don't really use it much. And I scoured all over the place here, Berkeley, San Jose, Livermore. They didn't have it. Finally, one of the welding supply stores was able to get two shipments overnight, which arrived yesterday um, for me. One from Houston, one from Chicago, OK? So I've got a ton of these things. That are, you, know, you can have one for three bucks at cost, basically. If you have a five, I'll give you a two, a two dollar bill back. Now, how many of you have a two dollar bill? They're not many in circulation. They do exist. They're brand new, Chris. My wife likes to um, be very friendly and make people happy. So she leaves these things in various places for people to find. Not that you're going to get rich out of two bucks, but the incredible joy people have at finding money, any amount of money. It's amazing. You know, even a dime, people are allowed. Wow, Stay in your pocket, look at the sun when you're standing in line in Disneyland or whatever, you know, put it through some spots. You'll be able to view this safely. Put it up close to your eyes, like that, and you can stare at the sun. Very safe. Okay, don't put it way out here. Put it right up to your eyes, or shade it like with that elbow. So, while I'm answering questions at the end, you know, just come up here, honor system, just stick them on there, take a $2 bill, and see maybe three, then don't take a $2 bill. You gave me a 10. Take seven back, but, okay? So that's what I recommend. Um, I, I usually sell them to my students for two bucks, so since they have to be FedEx over, the cost will not so close to All right, if you're using a telescope, be sure it is filtered at the top end. The filter has to come at this end before the light is collected. Some telescope companies will sell you telescopes that have a filter at the eyepiece end. Very bad news because all this light has been collected by the giant telescopes. Well, telescopes are meant generally not to look at the sun, but at faint stars and galaxies. So we want to collect lots of light. Um, it comes in and, and it can then heat up the eyepiece and crack the eyepiece at that end. So be sure that the telescope is fitted at the top end. If your eye is down here, here's what can happen this is a lens cap that one of my teaching assistants years ago left at the eyepiece end of the telescope, OK? And there was no filter in it. You know, so not only was there not a filter, but it wasn't, not only was it not at the top end, there was just no filter whatsoever. There was this eyepiece there, and he was going to aim the telescope at the sun, then put the filter on. Better to aim the tele better to put the filter on, then aim the telescope at the sun, because suppose some little kid or something is looking through the telescope while you're trying to position it toward the sun, you know, sunlight comes in. This is your eye on sunlight, okay? Um, or you can make a pinhole camera. This is another safe way to view them. Just punch a hole in a sheet of cardboard, okay? And the cardboard makes a shadow on the, on the screen here, but light rays from a luminous object go passing through the hole, form an image there, an image there, you get an inverted image of your object, but it's just the sun. Who cares if it's right side up or right upside down? Your eyes produce an upside down image on your retina, but your brain is used to it. So it just turns it right side up. But you're actually seeing things upside down right now, all the time. It's true. It's true. The, the, the lens in your eye is an upside down image. Anyway, um, so you know you can do all sorts of things here. I punched in the name of my son, Simon, here. Here's a bunch of crescent suns. <laughs> you have to view a phenomenon like this with Celestial Theme Candy, right? The eclipse got on the floor, got hit by the sky, Mars, Mars, 
more POA bars, starters, and things like that. But it put up some more of a kind of the most uh, uh, suitable one, I think. Uh, holes in leaves, in holes between leaves in trees can form little pitbull and hole cameras. Here's a uh, scene below a tree in Mexico in 1991. I was just walking along, noticed this under a tree. All these images of the, of the sun. Okay? You can also use um, a, a small telescope or binoculars. So as you cover up one of them, line up the two with the sun, that, that not only gathers more light than your eye does, but also magnifies it, because there's two lenses in a, in a pair of binoculars like this, and, and so it magnifies it, and so you can get a brighter magnified image like this. And if you open up both holes, and they're pointing at the sun, then, then you get a double image like this, and I, I call this sea cups, you know. So, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, but just be sure you don't look at the sun without a filter. You can put the filter, uh, what is my here? You can put the filter here, but if you do that, make sure it's securely fastened and doesn't fall off while you're looking at the sun. Again, these are your eyes you're dealing with, okay? And the sun is very, very bright, especially if you collect the light through a telescope. While waiting for the annular stages, you can have fun, you can play little games like this, little pac man type uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, And you know, if it's sunny, then you're going to be all happy and everything. And if it's cloudy like this, then perhaps it'll be sad. <laughs> but if the clouds open up in time for totality or the annular phase, then you will be happy again. <laughs> Even if it starts raining afterwards because after you've seen the annular phase, you know, the main shed is over. So again, that'll be a lot of fun. Uh, go somewhere here if you can. If you can't, still watch in the late afternoon of Sunday, May 20th. You'll see some amount of partial phases. And here in the Bay Area, you know, you'll see a nearly complete annual. So it'll look something like this, okay? Like this, all right? More so than I'm showing here. Um, so watch anyway, but but if you can, try to try to go somewhere in there. Okay? Alright, I, I have a few minutes left. I want to tell you about another event coming up, the June 5th so-called transit of Venus. And again, if you just uh, use your favorite search engine and stick in 2012 transit of Venus, you'll you'll find it. Here's a transit. Oh, oops, that's terrifying. Uh, well, okay. But it's the same phenomenon, okay? Venus occasionally, very rarely, goes right between us and the sun. Now, usually it doesn't, because the planes are not perfectly aligned, okay? Um, the next one is in 2117. So I don't think anyone in this room is going to see one after this, okay? There will be transits of Mercury, but they're hard to see, because Mercury is a, a smaller planet and it's farther away from the Earth, okay? But uh, the last one was in 2004. They come in in pairs, eight years apart, and then not again for over a century. There was a pair in um, 17, sorry, 1874 and 1880, no, sorry, 18, 18, 1874 and 1882, I think. And now 2004, which we missed, and 2012, okay? And then not until 2017. Now, here's a little hard thing to read, but not that hard. All the red parts, not the transit will not be visible at all. These parts here, including all of the US, the transit will be partly visible. It lasts six hours and 40 minutes. And several hours of it will be visible from California. And then the sun will set. And the remainder won't be visible. But, you know, the sun's going to be, I mean, Venus is going to kind of be just creeping across the sun's face. I don't think you need to watch all six hours and 40 minutes. <laughs> Nevertheless, I'm going to be in Hawaii. <laughs> the, the closest place east, or, yeah, the, the, let's put it this way. It's the first place you come to going west from California for which the entire thing will be visible before sunset. Okay, so you know, we're favored over the East Coast, the East Coast will see it in a little bit of it, and then we'll see more of it. Hawaii is the first place that we'll see all of it, and then the Pacific Ocean and uh, Asia will see all of it as well. Um, 
Anyway, so most of the world will see part of it, but we have great, great seats here. Great seats. From Berkeley, I mean, here you don't have to travel anywhere. Because look, look, you can be anywhere, anywhere. Just don't be sleeping, okay? And have your shade 14 glass, okay? Venus will be barely visible as a little black dot, one sixtieth of the size of the sun's disk. So don't, don't expect a big old huge black thing, like the moon covering the sun on May 20th. Okay, that's going to be a big black thing. It's going to be a little tiny dot, all right, covering the sun, but you can't see it just with shade 14 glass covering the sun. So two for one, if you have one of these things, you get two for one, then you can keep it, look for um, you know, sunspots and things like that. So uh, through a telescope, of course, you'll see much more. But uh, anyway, from Berkeley, the transit starts at 3.07 p.m. Might be difficult to see for the first 20 minutes or so because only part of Venus which is a disk, will have covered the sun. But a little bite will be taken out of the sun. Like, uh, just here's the sun, just a little tiny bite. And then the whole thing will be on it by around 327, 325, something like that. Mid eclipse, 627 p.m. But very much the same time as the, as the annular eclipse, by the way. It just starts a bit earlier. Okay? Sun's at 828, and the time's at 947. Okay? When it starts, Venus will be roughly at the 12 o'clock position on the sun's disk, as you're looking at it, 12, 15 or so. But because of the way things rotate as they, they're running across the sky, by the time the sun is setting, Venus will be roughly at the 4 o'clock position, if you want to look for it. How to view it, same thing, just hold up your shade 14 glass, very close to your eyes, and look at it. Okay, it'll be a little black dot. And, you know, it's... It's, it's not going to knock your socks off and stuff the way a total solar eclipse does. But it's kind of cool and very rare. And I will show you in my last few minutes of the historical significance, okay? Through a telescope, you'll be able to see a, a bigger, more magnified image, okay? But make sure there's a filter properly in place. I cannot overemphasize this, all right? A number of people have had a bend of their eyes, okay? Now, you might say, well, big deal. Well, you know, no one else. Alive, we'll see another one, okay? Unless the nanobots are improved so much in the next few decades that people achieve immortality the way Ray Kurzweil thinks we will. But I think it's going to be a while before we achieve immortality, okay? So you're never going to see another one of these again. So you might as well, okay? You might as well take some time off the afternoon of Tuesday, June 5th, and look at this, okay? The historical significance was the following. And in the context of the historical significance, I think it's a, a, a cool thing. In the time of Copernicus, the relative distances of the planets were known. And very briefly, for the inner planets, you know, there, were, there was this geometrical configuration that worked for Mercury and Venus. We're one astronomical unit from the sun, that's just the definition of the Earth distance from the sun. When a planet is farthest west or east from the sun, then you know this angle turns out to be 90 degrees. And you can measure this angle, that's just a, how far away from the sun it appears to be. So you have a side, and you have an angle, and you have an angle, and that turns out to determine that triangle exactly. That tells you the distance from Earth to Venus or Mercury in terms of the distance to the sun. Plus the planet's and you can do a similar thing for the outer planets, whatever. Copernicus knew these relative distances, okay? He knew that Mercury was 38% Earth's distance from the sun. He knew that Venus is 72% Earth's distance from the sun. Earth's distance is Earth's distance. That's the unit, okay? Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, whatever. But they did not know the value of the astronomical unit. What is it? It's 93 million miles, 150 million kilometers. But they did not know that then. And many people have been trying before and subsequently to get the distance of Earth from, from the sun. And there were various estimates of somewhat dubious credibility and all that. The most accurate estimates came in the late 18th century using a transit of Venus in the following way. Okay? So here's Venus transiting the sun. It happened in uh, 
1761 and 1769. Okay? And well, as suppose you're looking at it. Alright? Crusade 14 class, they're pretty much James Cook went to his local level and supply store and got the You see where it is relative to the sun, okay? From a different position on Earth, Venus will appear at a slightly different position on the sun. That's like if you hold your finger up, close to your eyes, and close one eye and then close the other. Relative to the more distant background objects, my finger shifts. That's an effect known as parallax. So because Venus is closer to us than the sun is, Venus shift, shifts more if we look at it from two different places on Earth. It shifts more than the sun does. And you have to take the sun shift into account as well. But nevertheless, you know, Venus' shift is bigger. And this is like what surveyors do when they figure out distances. They use triangulation. You look at from point A, the position of this tree relative to some background trees or mountains or whatever. Then you do it from point B. You know this baseline. You can measure this angle, and that solves your triangle, and that tells you how far away you are from the tree. Okay? This is actually what gives you depth perception. This is why we have two eyes separated by a little bit. Okay? If you were to grow up with just one eye, you wouldn't have this, at least not nearly as well. If you go blind in one eye, you retain a little bit of it, just because you, you know how big a person looks when they're six feet away from you, and you know how big they when they're far away, because you, you built up all that experience. But if you never had the luxury of, of looking at a 3D world with two eyes, you wouldn't have much uh, depth perception. Okay? So here's the idea. Viewed from two different places on Earth, separated along north-south direction. East-west doesn't work as well. Um, Venus will appear either here or there, and actually will cruise across the sun like that or like that. So here's the sun. So here's the side view. So looking at Venus from point P on Earth, you see it projected on the sun's disk there. At the same moment of time, from point P prime, you see Venus projected on the place there. Now I've greatly exaggerated that effect. That effect is about one third of the diameter of Venus's little black dot. So it's a small effect. And in fact, it's very hard to measure something that's only one third of uh, Venus's size. Okay. Nevertheless, this, uh, this, is, uh, this is true. There's this little parallax effect. Okay. As I said, there's a complication. You can go the sun's parallax. No, no big deal. Okay. Um, one of my slides is hidden, but that's okay. I'm not sure where I went. Maybe I can leave it. Uh, Halley, Edmund Halley, of Comet kind of Halley thing. No, I don't know. I have it. It's an excellent. Yeah. The parallax kind of just so much. But nevertheless, um, they, um, they measured it in the 18th century. Okay? And the trick came from Edmund Halley. He realized that it's easier, rather than measuring this little tiny parallax shift, it's easier to measure the time it takes for Venus to go along this chord and along that chord, right? You just have the time, well, it started here and ended there. And in this case, having been displaced up a little bit, it started here and ended there, and so that's a bigger path to traverse. And so that, that amount of time turns out to be easier to measure than the actual vertical displacement. And so using Halley's technique, this could be done pretty accurately, OK? Just measure these times, okay? So, um, in 1761 uh, and 1769, a number of measurements were made. Astronomer Charles Mason and his uh, partner Jeremiah Dixon of the famous Mason Dixon line measured it. Um, but the most famous measurement was made by Captain James Cook in 1769. He was commissioned by the King of, of England to go and explore the southern territories, and indeed, to map out New Zealand and the east coast of Australia and claim them for, for, uh, for England, okay? But the, the excuse for going down there, even though they really wanted to raid, you know, was to, uh, was to measure the position of Venus. And 
King George himself made an observation from England. Okay, so there's things. So, all right, and from these trans observations done by Cook and others, okay, you can't just do it alone. You have friends somewhere else. They uh, they calculated that the distance is 153 million kilometers from the Earth to uh, to uh, the Sun, and the true value is 150 million. That's an error of only 2%, which is pretty amazing. 1769, they did this, using the transit of means. By far the most accurate measurement of the distance of the sun. And this was confirmed in the transits of 1874 and 1882. And there was a lot of data taken at nearby Lake Observatory, which is owned and operated by the uh, University of California. So basically, finally, by the late 1800s, by the late 1700s, we knew the distance of the sun. And that's kind of cool. So be sure to see it. And um, and it'll be you know it'll be a lot of fun. By the way, this is also the technique being used by the Kepler satellite out there right now, searching for planets around other stars. Occasionally, those planetary systems have their their angle inclined by 90 degrees for our line of sight, rather than some random angle of 90 degrees. So occasionally, planets pass between us and the sun and the star they are orbiting, by measuring accurately the brightness of the star that they are orbiting, we will see that brightness dip down a little tiny bit. And the Kepler satellite, if you Google Kepler satellite, uh, you'll find that they're making amazing progress. Since they started operating a year and a half ago, they found over 2,300 exoplanet candidates, the vast majority of which are probably truly other planets orbiting other stars. And that's another important aspect of transits observed in our solar system. They serve as a model for the technique that's being used to find most of the exoplanets these days. Clearly one of the most exciting fields in, in all of astrophysics. And I don't have more time to talk about that now because I, I don't want to answer questions. But uh, anyway, so I'll stick around for questions. Uh, I'll let people make a graceful exit want, you can come by here on our system, just get a piece of glass, and as long as no other lecture needs this room, I'll, I'll stay here and answer questions for quite a while. Thank you very much.